modifying the hypothesis. After you do an experiment and you go through and you observe characteristics and everything, you gather new information based on what you did. Question comes down to, does that change the hypothesis that you started out with? Or does it modify things? Let's take a look at it. First off, we deal with the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that hypothesis that you set up in the beginning. The null hypothesis basically states that there is no significant difference between specific populations, any observed difference being due to the sampling or experimental error. Basically, what we're testing in the null hypothesis is that the effects that you are looking at have no difference on what you've got. Now, you can't really prove that, so what you do is you test that there is significant difference in there. And therefore, what you're looking at is that any difference you have is due to difference between the specific populations, and it's not due to sampling error or to sampling or experimental errors. So your null hypothesis, no difference exists. Therefore, there is no difference based on treatment. So when you test it, you test it looking at, do you have a difference based on treatment? Therefore, if you do, you know that the null hypothesis is wrong. You test it statistically. There are certain processes. We are not going to go into all of the different processes in the class on that, but we're looking at a statistic test in there. The concept is that you can prove similarity, and if similarity occurs, then there is no difference between treatments. So if you can't prove their difference, they're similar, and if they're similar, then there's no difference between treatments. And that's what your null hypothesis is all about. We have the alternate hypothesis. In the alternate hypothesis, it says there is a difference between specific populations. Any observed differences are not due to sampling or experimental error. If we can prove there's a difference between the populations and it's not due to sampling or experimental error, then we've got proof that the original hypothesis that we are looking at is correct. Therefore, we're looking for a difference based on treatment and not on sampling or experimental error. The concept is since that you cannot prove similarity, then there was a difference based on treatment. Modifying the hypothesis. You ran your test and you didn't find significance. Did you notice anything about your experiment that may have been a cause? Now, notice, we ask a lot of questions because what we want to do is question authority, and we want to pay attention to what's going on to see whether or not there is something in there that might have caused something. So it says, you ran your experiment, you didn't find any significance. Does that mean your experiment's complete failure, you need to throw it out? No. You need to go back, you now have more observational data, you now have material that you can work with see what you can do with it. Did something occur that was not accounted for? So you ran it, you checked your variables, and all of a sudden something occurred. Well, that could that have been within what you did? And, you know, what are we going to look at in here? Now, here's your example. This comes from experiments that I ran when I was quite early on in my career. It says, calcium is an integral part of the middle mill of plants and therefore helps maintain plant integrity. Increasing calcium content in plants should therefore increase resistance to pathogens. These are proven concepts. They're factual. Calcium is an integral part of the middle lamella of plant and therefore helps maintain plant integrity. The middle lamella being that part in between plant cells that holds plant cells together. You increase the calcium content, the middle lamella becomes stronger. Therefore, it should help the plant be able to resist a pathogen that would get in there and produce an enzyme that would break down the middle lamella. And in this particular case, we did this test on two different pathogens. One is anthracnose on soybean. It's a foliar pathogen. One is Phytophthora capsaici on green pepper, which is a root pathogen. Now notice, we've got a little bit of difference in there between the two systems we're setting up. This comes from the paper that was published in Plant Disease 64, 1980. The relationship between tissue calcium, which are the solid dots, and anthracnose, which are the little X's of soybean seedlings grown in modified Hoagland solution. 
we have different levels of micrograms calcium added to the Hoagland solution. You can see the disease rating after we sprayed the material, and you can see the percent calcium in the tissue on the right-hand side. What we see in here is you have a linear regression line going up the center based on calcium content, and you can see the various calcium contents as the little balls going up, and there is your regression line. It gives you your slope plus your constant plus your R value, which is exceedingly high for this and it also shows you where your disease is and you can see that as you add calcium in your disease level drops off so therefore you have negative sort of effect in here as calcium goes up disease goes down and it's a very prominent sort of thing and it's statistically significant we're looking at the effects of calcium salts on the pH of amended soil sample after harvesting pepper plants were inoculated with phytophthora capsicii at 25 days and were harvested 15 days later what was done was soil was taken, the soil was amended with various levels of calcium per gram of soil, and these are micrograms calcium per gram of soil. We used four different calcium materials, calcium chloride, calcium hydroxide, calcium carbonate, calcium sulfate. We were looking for an effect between calcium and disease, and we didn't get it. We're going, wait a second, what happened here? And we went back and we started looking at it. You can see that on the calcium chloride, you didn't get a pH change. On the calcium sulfate, you didn't get a pH change, but you did get a rather substantial one on the calcium hydroxide and the calcium carbonate. Number one, is our treatment affected something more than just the calcium content of the plant? It affected the basic parameters in here of the pH of the soil. And you can see the calcium chloride actually decreased the pH a little bit. The calcium sulfate really didn't change it either up or down. So when we went out and we looked at disease, we found that something wasn't there that we were expecting because we had modified something that changed something else. So we started looking at this and we started going, what in the world is going on in here? This is what happens. When you take calcium hydroxide or calcium carbonate, they are often used as what we call lime, and lime is used to raise the soil pH. With calcium carbonate, the calcium carbonate plus two hydrogen ions form calcium plus the bicarbonate ion which breaks down into water and carbon dioxide and basically what you do is you raise the pH with calcium oxide. The calcium oxide plus water gives you calcium hydroxide. The calcium hydroxide picks up hydrogen, gives you divalent calcium plus water. If you bring in the calcium chloride, calcium sulfate, neither one of these react with the hydrogen ion concentration, therefore you do not get a change in pH. So all of a sudden, our treatment did something that we weren't necessarily expecting, and we got a different result from what we were anticipating. Now the question comes down to it. Modifying the hypothesis. In the case of the first test of the foliar pathogen, the hypothesis worked extremely well, and therefore the hypothesis was demonstrated to be correct based on the information that we had. In the case of the second test of the root pathogen, the effect was more of a soil acid level rather than a calcium content. This is knowledge. We understand how this happens and we put everything together to be able to gather that knowledge and come together with a good explanation of what we've got. When modification is made, if the original design will hold, then the experiment need not be repeated. However, additional data may be required. This goes back to wisdom, that common sense sort of thing, good judgment. What we found was that with the second one, we had a new set of values. We had some new information, which meant we didn't need to repeat the original test However, we did need to gather additional data in order to be able to demonstrate that what we were talking about was actually correct. And we did this by taking the pathogen and growing it in different pH solutions and, and things like that to see where things actually came in. And we came up with a rather good paper on that. So when you deal with it, it doesn't mean that just because the, it didn't work the first time, go back and look at it and figure out what's going on. Now, that doesn't mean that in all cases you can do this. Because sometimes when you put things together in the beginning, you just had a bad experimental design and you need to restart over and rethink everything you did. This is where science people 
people don't understand it because it doesn't mean that just because it didn't work out the first time that you got it all wrong. It may be part of what you did was wrong and you need to go back and work on that. So when we deal with this, this modifying the hypothesis becomes very important and understanding that you can do that becomes very important.